to join him. Alongside the world's leading CEO, we have the world's leading business coach. He sold more books than almost anybody. <laughs> He's nominated year after year as the world's leading business coach. So please welcome from America, Marshall Goldsmith. <laughs> Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? What we're going to do, I'll give you the format. Uh, Lars and I are going to talk for 30 or 40 minutes. Then we're going to open everything up to Q&A. I'm going to wander around and ask you for questions. You now have uh, 20 seconds. You're going to stand up, find someone you do not know, and go sit next to that person. Go! Stand up! Find somebody you don't know. Sit next to that person. <laughs> No, it's good. Yeah. So they sit by your partner. Sit, sit, sit. All right, sit by your new partner. Sit, 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 sit. Now, getting started. Shh, shh, shh. Sit by your new partner. Getting started. Uh, Lars, why don't you introduce yourself to the group? Tell them a little bit of your background of life. Louder. Is this better? Okay, Lars, tell them about your story of life, how you got started, and your transition to being where you are right now. Thank you, uh, Marshall, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for uh, inviting me today. Um, I'm, I'm born in the south side of Copenhagen. It's sort of like the south side of Chicago. It's not necessarily a very attractive area. Um, in a middle-class family, my father was an engineer, so when I, I finished high school, I was contemplating what to do with my life, and for, for lack of imagination, I started engineering education. I found it, and I have to apologize to all the engineers here, I found it extraordinarily boring, and consequently, I left uh, the engineering school after three months, and spent the rest of the year teaching at the school that I just left, contemplating what then to do. Uh, I was thinking about maybe I should become a pilot for a young man. That sounds like an exciting thing to do. And I realized that this is just a sophisticated bus driver going from A to B and B to A. And it's probably going to get tiring after a while. So now, now you've insulted not only the engineers, but the yeah, pilots. I'm going to end up, <laughs> end up as consulting, uh, insulting everyone. So then I was thinking about medicine. Uh, I have some members of my family that are in healthcare, uh, but I also worked as a janitor at a hospital. And uh, the janitors are the lowest on the totem pole in the hospital. So consequently, I was uh, the recipient of all the, the warm and tender, loving attention from the doctors in the hospital. And uh, I was not very impressed, I have to say. Uh, so I dropped medicine and, and then ended up deciding on becoming a forester. Uh, it's it's a sort of almost like a military education, at least it was at that point in time. It suited my maturity, uh, and uh, I got a lot of physical exercise. And I'm just saying all of this because you know that I have been working for 16 years as CEO of a pharmaceutical company. So in a way, I got all my best wishes fulfilled. I fly around on the world all the time. I fly as much as a pilot. I just don't have to do it myself and I work with medicine and human health. Uh, that's a long story from the education to where I got uh, to the CEO job, but I, get, I guess we'll get to that. Yes, yes. You know, one of the things that we talked about, I'm writing a new book on the leader of the future, and I think I had the privilege of spending some time with Lars before uh, this session, and I really think that a lot of your leadership style is a perfect role model for the leader of the future. And again, not just because you've been successful. We talked about this. To be honest, a lot of successful CEOs are just lucky. I mean, they are just lucky. They were standing in the right place at the right time. Some of them are terrible people, and they just got lucky. We agree. Yeah, we agree. A lot of life <laughs> is luck, right? On the other hand, I think this guy's leadership style wasn't luck. It makes a ton of sense. You had the privilege of working with very brilliant knowledge workers. If you can share with the leaders in this room, what are the things you learned leading those types of, of brilliant people? Yeah, for a period of time, I, I was in the operational side of the business, 
And uh, by hard work and the, the intellectual gifts that I had, for a long while I could be domain leader in, in my expertise. But after a while, it was getting increasingly difficult as I rose in the ranks because I found out that the other people were actually smarter than I was. And you can imagine running a pharmaceutical company, not having a medical degree, but some kind of biological understanding, mm. uh, that the other guys are much smarter than I am. Mm. And so you, you don't motivate people like that by sort of demand and control environment. You have to, to have them see an opportunity, something that they think is so exciting that they, they, they want to use their time on it especially research people. If you want them to stop working on a research project, give them another one that's more exciting, they'll stop immediately. Mm. If you don't do that, they'll continue to work on their research project, and you can't stop them mm. unless you fire them. Mm. You know, um, one of the CEOs in your industry, I had the privilege of coach, is J.P. Garnier. And I, I asked J.P., what did you learn about leadership as the CEO of GlaxoSmithKline? He said, I've learned a very hard lesson. He said, my suggestions become orders. And I said, if they're smart, they're orders. And if they're stupid, they're orders. And if I want them to be orders, they're orders. If I don't want them to be orders, they're orders anyway. My suggestions are orders. For nine years, I trained the admirals in the United States Navy. What's the first thing I teach the admirals when you get that star? Your suggestions become orders. Admirals don't make suggestions. Admirals give orders. As a CEO of a huge company, and by the way, your success is a blessing and a curse, as I'm sure you learned. People actually start listening to you. How do you fight that urge to talk and make suggestions and realize maybe I'm not the expert here? Well, if you're honest with yourself and, and you understand the quality of the people that you work with, it is, it's very obvious uh, that they are, they are possessing the knowledge. And it's only by combining our, our knowledge in the group that we can come up with a chance of having a solution which may be sustainable. Um, and, and I think what, one of the big, biggest transitions is actually going from operational leadership to CEO. And many of you here are, are CEOs of corporations. And, and um, after a while, this is the biggest transition in your job because you, all of a sudden you have the total responsibility of the corporation towards society, towards all the employees, towards your customers. And, and this is, uh, was, at least in my case, very humiliating. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, um, and so what we have been doing in, in my old company was that we tried to, or I tried personally to adopt a leadership style where I shared with my colleagues and those that were talent group uh, in the company, the good and the bad things about life. We, this, you can't do that one hour in the morning at a big plenum meeting. Uh, you have to go somewhere, take people out of there, daily context, uh, shake them up a little bit to the jungle or somewhere else and uh, give them some tasks which will tire them out a little bit and then after a while have them realize that we're all the same. I mean, I'm no more genius than they are. My life has not always been rosy. I've made mistakes in my personal life, mm. my business life. And, and so sharing that vulnerability uh, will make, at least it made me less lonely. Mm -hmm in the job, mm -hmm. and we all realized that, you know, come on, they're going through a tough patch. Let's give them a break and help them along. They'll be in the lead next time, uh, and then uh, we can take the back seat. So, so that has worked for me in my context, but everyone is in a different business environment, so I have respect for that as well. You know, one thing that you did with your group, which I found fascinating, you've talked about it a little bit, is the lifeline exercise. If you don't mind, that's an exercise you could share with the group. It's something people can take back and, if they want to, use for themselves. Yes, this was, and, and again here, this is stolen with pride um, from Unilever. Uh, there is a book, uh, To the Desert and Back. There was a, a brand group in Unilever that had to revitalize a, a brand, and uh, they had a new leadership team. They went somewhere, as I say, remote, and the team was gilded and shook up. What, we, what we've done in my company is the same. We've taken people uh, and spent, I spent a week together with the leadership talent, exposing them to business challenges, environmental and social challenges, and then leadership challenges. 
And uh, in order to illustrate the leadership challenges, we challenged them to say, we would like you to draw your lifeline. Go sit together two by two. Somebody you don't know already in the company, uh, don't feel fearful. Put in as much detail as you like. Normally people would put in their perception of their career and some of the challenges. I encourage them by going first myself publicly to the whole group, uh, by also including my lifeline on the personal level. And the interesting thing is, of course, not surprising, that there is this very, very stark relationship between uh, the professional career and your personal life. Uh, and this became very, very obvious. And, and this made these people open up to each other uh, for their fears, concerns, anxieties, and realize that everybody has the same problems. And by, by knowing each other, they could help each other out. So there was no John Wayne style leadership uh, that was gonna carry the group. For a certain period of time, in certain situation, that leadership style is okay. But in most times of normal business operation, it doesn't work. Well, if we look at the history of leadership, mm -hmm. and we talked about this, see, in the old days, you were at a cave. All right, big guy wins and gets old, and then the young guy comes and beats up the big guy, and they start over again. Then you have the master and the apprentice. And then eventually, leadership starts becoming global, not local. You're dealing with multicultures, not one culture. Technology is changing all the time. And more and more, that old image of leadership that we had of this one person who knows everything and it tells people what to do and they all salute the flag and go do it, is disappearing. Because as Peter Drucker taught me, when you manage a knowledge worker, you can't tell them what to do and how to do it. Also, my old mentor was Dr. Paul Hersey. He taught me situational leadership. Well, I'm a great believer in situational leadership, but it says use the leadership style that matches the readiness level of the person being led. That makes sense. Here's the problem. Let's imagine that I'm the leader. You're motivated, you wanna learn, and you need to learn. Well, a teaching style would be appropriate. There's one problem. How can I teach you when you know more than me? <laughs> so the role of the leader then becomes not to provide the knowledge, but to help the person find the knowledge. Ask the questions. I mean, the most difficult thing is, is not to find the answers. The most difficult thing is to define the right question. Uh, because we have knowledge that we can provide lots of solutions to questions. The problem is we sometimes work on the wrong question. And, and, and so, so, and when you start to realize this, I mean, everybody, you don't have to be an expert to ask questions and to probe people. So what is the right question to answer? Uh, everybody will have an opportunity to, to weigh in. And, and then after a while, and then you have to be, of course, sometimes you have to, to make decisions because you're under pressure. I mean, something has to go out next morning or you're under pressure from competition or you're being sued or whatever. Um, uh, but normally, take time. Things are not gonna deteriorate. Take your time and get the right questions first. You know, probably one of the greatest leaders I ever coached is Alan Mulally. Alan was the CEO of the Ford Motor Company. Stock went from $1 to $18.40, CEO of the year in the United States. Wonderful human being, wonderful guy. Alan goes to Ford, company's losing 17 billion with a B dollars. He says to the top 16 leaders, give me your top five priorities, red, yellow, green. The first meeting, uh, <laughs> 16 leaders, five priorities, red, yellow, green. Red is, I'm not on plan, don't know how to get there. Yellow, I'm not on plan, have a strategy, and, and green is, I'm on plan. The first meeting, 18 le 16 leaders, five priorities, 80 priorities, all green, all green. So Alan said, well, we're losing $17 billion, and everyone is on plan. I guess the plan must be to lose at least 17 billion because that's where we're going here. I'm sure, I'm sure everyone here is working with balanced scorecards and KPIs and we tend to create a green culture because everybody wants to be successful. We don't think about, are we asking the right things? Well, and back to the right question, Alan said, why don't we try it again? Finally, Mark Fields, who's now the CEO of Ford, says red. Alan applauds and he goes, thank you. Thank you for saying red. Then he said, Mark, I want to assure you of one thing. You're not on plan, and you don't know how to get there. He said, I'm the CEO of the Ford Motor Company. Let me assure you of one thing. I know less than you do. Why don't we just work together and find people who can help us get the answer? And it doesn't matter at what level you are in. 
See, the one thing I've encouraged this guy to do is, this guy needs to write a book, he needs to get out there and spread the message. Do you agree or disagree with me? Yes. 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 Let's try again. If you agree, say yes. Do you agree? Yes. Very good, very good. This, I'm, yeah, agree. I'm, I'm not good at taking coaching. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this guy needs to get out there because the one thing that we were talking about is his leadership style may be common sense or sound like common sense. It's a long way from common practice. It's a long way from common practice. Most CEOs don't do what he did. Most CEOs play the role of I'm the expert, I know everything. Mm -hmm. And I would really encourage you just to get out there and spread the word. People in the audience that are familiar with the Danish business environment will know that I've been CEO of a company that has a, an extraordinary ownership structure, uh, which does give certain advantages and gives certain obligations to us leading the company, uh, being able to focus on long-term growth right. as opposed to short-termism. Uh, that, uh, that has been a benefit, but it has not precluded us from being financially successful. And so when people talk about short-term versus long-term, it is the obligation of the CEO together with the board to define a long-term strategy, not a short-term strategy. Mm -hmm. um, because only through long-term focus can you create real sustainable value. Mm -hmm. And even if you have to have quarterly reports, you're just gonna have to yell together with your uh, board of directors and say, we don't mind. The next quarter may not be pretty. The next one may not either. But I can tell you long term, you're going to get a better return. And our business is more sustainable than it would otherwise have been. Uh, we could talk a lot about uh, capital markets. Uh, but uh, it just suffice to say that it's your obligation uh, to ensure uh, that you take a long term view uh, of the company. You know, another reinforcement of that is the importance of honesty and transparency. I'm unfortunately working with a new CEO of a Fortune 500 company in the States, and the previous CEO basically, classic problem, make my number. Make my number. Somebody said, well, I don't think I can make the number. I guess I'll find someone who can. Make my number. Well, you tell people that enough, you know what happens? They mm. make the number. Mm. They make the number up. They stuff the pipeline. Now, she's the CEO of this company that is just a complete train wreck because of this make my number mindset, very important to be honest, because it, it, unless you have a printing machine, you, you can only do that so long anyway. Oh yeah, it'll catch up with you. It all, it's like a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. You can't do it very long. <laughs> now, this is your chance to give some advice to some wonderful leaders out there in the audience. Th this guy is one of the greatest leaders probably in this century. So listen closely. I, I don't want to talk about the big stuff they can't control. By the way, one rule, we're going to have Q&A today. Zero Donald Trump conversation. So <laughs> I'm burned out on Donald Trump. So talk about anything but Donald Trump. So yeah, I, I was I was actually going to be pre I was prepared to go into some broader societal economic uh, issues uh, that I I find somewhat disturbing at the moment. But I was told not to. Yeah. Uh, because give, give Marshall them a, said them some that advice. they're not that they're, they're going to fall asleep. They're not going to be able to do anything about it anyway. Uh, so th then I was thinking about this realization of what the leadership role is mm. and, uh, and how you experience being responsible uh, for an entire organization, mm. their families, mm. their shareholders, your impact on society. And can you truly relate to somebody that you can air your concerns, mm. your uncertainty with. Mm. I found it difficult, I have to admit. That's why I've, I'm not high on coaching. Uh, and and I, I found it difficult to uh, have that honest, uh, transparent conversation with the chairman. He's my boss, I mean. And, and if I go and tell him, you know, I'm freaking out, uh, I don't know what to do, and, and he's gonna freak out, and then everybody's gonna freak out. So I find this to be, a, a, a very, very difficult topic which makes the life uh, leading organizations uh, quite challenging. And, and it's, at the same time, it is, it is quite work intensive. Uh, so, and I haven't really, I must admit, I haven't really started thinking about it until I stopped. 
It's sort of like riding a bicycle. You keep riding and riding and riding and riding, and you never have time to really reflect on those personal things. Uh, so one thing I, I think you should, before you get to my age and not being asked to leave, uh, think about it. To live a, a more balanced life, perhaps. There is a life after work. And, you know, it's very few people that knock on St. Peter's door and by ask, say, I should have spent more time at work. Very few people. So uh, think about that, the balance uh, in, your, in your life. It'll make you more happy, uh, I think, and it'll make you better leaders. You know, one thing I was really impressed with when I read one of the stories about you was your comment about curing diabetes that company maybe doesn't exist or doesn't exist as much, who cares? You'd still be proud. If you could share that with the group. Oh, yeah. I, I thought that was great. Yeah, 80% of our revenues and 80% or even more of the value of the company is predicated on us treating diabetes. Um, but we were given a gift in 1921 when the discovery of insulin from the University of Toronto, this gift was taken back to, to Denmark to enable manufacturing of insulin to treat people with diabetes. And, and consequently, over more than 90 years, and soon to be 100 years, uh, have been working with this community that had been struck by a debilitating, life-threatening chronic condition. And so we realized that, I mean, what should we do? What we, and when we traveled around the world and asked patients, groups like this, so what do you really want us to develop? An inhalation of insulin, an automatic pen, a continuous pump, new, what kind of new drugs? They say, we want to get rid of our diabetes. So if we want to be customer oriented, we have to cure diabetes. And there is this interesting thing, if it can be done, it will be done. So I say to my employees, to people like you, it's better that we do it than somebody else does it. There may be a business opportunity in it, but if it, it is such a huge problem that we might as well do it. And so we're working on it, it's still, haunting us uh, still some years into the future, but some curative treatments, I believe, will be available in 15 years. You know, I think a very important point is money and status and all that is important to a degree. But when you get older, you have to look in the mirror. And if you're not happy with what you, you see, use it. <laughs> you can't use it anyway. And if you're not happy with who you see in the mirror, what difference does it make? And if you think of your life curing diabetes, what would that mean? And having a few million bucks, what does that mean? It's not really close. Well, I find it hard to get into my sports car now that I'm getting older. So, <laughs> so, so no, I know, you, you, but it is very easy for us to say. Yeah. It's very easy for us to say that it's there. It's a much different thing when you're in your 30s and 40s and have aspirations of growing your career and becoming financially independent. So it's a little bit, of course, of a luxury perspective, uh, but uh, the truth is that it, that's what it is. That's what it is. Here's what we're going to do next. My area of expertise is helping successful leaders achieve positive, lasting change in behavior. I'm not an expert on strategy. I'm not an expert on marketing. I'm not an expert on global issues. This guy is number one CEO in this country and in the world. You're going to talk to your partner. You're going to come up with a question for him and a question for me. I'm going to wander around the room, and we're going to practice this feed forward idea. Say, what's your question? I give you an idea. Now, if I give you the dumbest idea in the world, what do you say back? You just say thank you. Then you ask him a question, he gives you an idea, you say thank you. That way we're gonna get a whole lot of questions out and a whole lot of ideas out in a very short period of time. And also we don't hear the same people ask the questions all the time. So we'll get, get a nice mix of people. To your marks, get set. You've got 30 seconds to come up with a question for him and a question for me. Go, 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 go. <laughs> He's 
got a good one? Okay, stop. Stop, stop, stop. Now, I have a request. Please speak into the mic, and you need to get pretty close when you speak into the mic so people can hear you. Who's got the good question? Sir. That's for you. Okay. Yeah. We heard about Lars and his uh, experience as a CEO. And you have um, coached a lot of uh, leaders in the US. Yeah. What's the biggest difference between Lars and uh, the most leaders that you have uh, coached? I think the difference between Lars and my friend Alan Mulally, who I think is the greatest leader I've ever coached, and Francis Hesselbein, the greatest leader I've ever coached, close to zero. Close to zero. Uh, the difference between him and some crappy leaders that I've coached, huge. <laughs> By the way, I, I, not, I won't mention the name. Not only have I coached the man who was ranked the number one leader in America, I coached the guy who was ranked the worst CEO in America. <laughs> and, you know, there are bad CEOs in every country, right? I'm sure Denmark has some terrible CEOs. By the way, another CEO in Denmark I worked with is... Um, okay, trivia question. Let's see who can guess who it is first. He was the CEO of a Fortune 50 company. He's from Denmark. He's a tennis player. Jan Leslie. Jan Leslie had the best social skills of any CEO I have ever met in my life. This guy, have any of you ever met him before? W wonderful man, just fantastic social skills, great with people, polite, and a, and a really good leader. So, you know, he's from Denmark. He could have been from any place. By the way, his social skills were matched by only one other person I met, Bill Clinton. The guy was Bill Clinton quality social skills. An amazing, amazing man. I don't think it had much to do with being from Denmark, no offense. I'm sure they're crappy leaders in Denmark too. I just happened to met some good ones. <laughs> okay, who's got a good question for the number one leader right up there? So we have been talking a lot about failure and rewarding failure uh, in the pra past session uh, and about uh, creating innovation. So can you, can you tell us about your greatest failure and how you proceed from there and learn from it. Yeah, as for my introduction, you would, you would realize that I'm not a scientist myself, so uh, I rely on, on input from our colleagues uh, on which projects to pursue. Uh, I have participated in some of the most spectacular failures. Uh, I've decided on some of the most spectacular failures we've made. Uh, so it is, it is obvious that from my experience, you have to try, but it is, and you have to resource projects maximally so they have maximum progress, and then you have to evaluate them on an ongoing basis and kill them fast. And this is where the CEO comes in uh, as responsible, because as I said in the introduction, the scientists will not give up their projects. They fall in love with their science. They fall in love with their technology. You will have to make the decision is this ready for the market? Can it go through the next stages of development? And is it good enough so that we can get something through and make room for more uh, projects coming through? But we have to experiment and fail. You know, to reinforce a, a very good point up there, 360-degree uh, feedback I've done with medical R&D companies, the item that comes in last place in every company, willing to let go of projects that will not work. <laughs> I'm an MD, I'm a PhD, I put my soul into this project for seven years. It's pretty hard to say this is not going to work. It's pretty hard to let it go. So that's a tough, tough job. Okay, who's got a good question for me? <laughs> yes, <laughs> sir. Uh, I would like to know if uh, Noah was not owned by a foundation, would have been sold a long time ago, and how do we keep uh, companies in Europe uh, to, to grow? and not sell them off to American companies? Well, um, I guess it was not for you, Marshall, then. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I, I, he, he, he needs to work on his listening skills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but anyway, thank you for the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are, we are blessed uh, with a unique ownership structure in Denmark, which allows us uh, to capitalize companies uh, after the founders uh, require new capital uh, to grow the companies without losing control and eventually you can put this into foundation ownership uh, prohibiting takeovers and this allows companies to uh, take a long-term perspective and uh, you can't do that everywhere else 
And so everywhere else uh, you, are, you are required to work, as I said, between the leadership and the board of directors, convince the board of directors that we are taking a long-term view on this. We're not gonna sell the company, but of course, if the company is not performing, then you, are, then you are being taken, then you will be taken over. So you have to ensure some level of performance. You can't just say, well, next year, or next year, or next year, everything will be great. So you have to have a continuous level of performance, but then maximize the value on the long term. Uh, we have the blessing that by ownership structure, we can, we can get that uh, by birth. It has to be earned uh, in companies elsewhere. And this is far more difficult. This is also why I, I took the liberty of saying, well, we have been recognized. And first of all, I'm not the best CEO of the world. I'm C I've been CEO of the best company in the world. And, and, and part of that is the ownership structure. Part of that is the cultural, social context that we've grown up in here in Scandinavia. And I could go on and on and on and on and on. And of course, that is not translatable directly to companies in other cultures with other ownership structures. And I, I'm sorry, I can't help you there. You have to perform so that you can justify long-term ownership of your company. And then once you gain that uh, credibility, then you can start to convince shareholders to take a longer term view. Yes, Marshall, so here's one for you. What is the best question you have ever asked that it has the most impact? Uh, the best question I've ever asked that has the most impact, I'll share with the group right now. I think it's not only a, a good one for me, it's a good one for you. Is everybody ready? Look up here. I want you all to smile. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Do your hand like this and go, ah, hand, 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 ah, ah, ah. You too, hand, hand, hand. <laughs> now, I want you to imagine that you're 95 years old and you're just getting ready to die. Right before you take that last breath, you're given a beautiful gift, the ability to go back in time and talk to the person in this room. The ability to help this person be a better leader, a better professional, much more important, the ability to help this person have a better life. The question is, what advice would that wise old person who knows what really mattered in life and what did not matter, what was important and what was not important, what advice would that wise old person have for the you that is sitting in this room right now? I don't want you to say anything, write anything, do anything. Answer that question in your mind. That's the question. Whatever you're thinking now, do that. Some friends of mine interviewed old folks who were dying, got to ask this question. What advice would you have? On the personal side, three themes. Theme number one, three words. Be happy now. Not next month, not next week, not next year. Be happy now. We talked about how lucky the people in this room are. The great western disease, I will be happy when. When I get that money status, BMW condominium, I will be happy when. <laughs> Learning point from old people, I got so busy chasing what I did not have, I could not see what I did have when I had everything. Well, many of you are very, very lucky people. You've got a whole lot. Try not to miss that in your journey through life. Learning point number two from old people, friends and family. When you look around your deathbed, none of your coworkers are waving goodbye. <laughs> you realize these friends and family, they're, they're kind of important right now. And, and number three, if you have a dream, go for it. Because you don't go for it when you're 40. You might not when you're 50, and you probably won't when you're 80. And it doesn't have to be a big dream, maybe a little dream. Go to New Zealand, speak Spanish, play a guitar. Other people think your dream is goofy. Who cares? It's not their dream. It's your dream. It's not their life, it's your life. Had a very embarrassing experience a couple of years ago. I was teaching this class and I said, go to New Zealand, speak Spanish. Guy <laughs> raised his hand, he goes, we're in Spain, you idiot. We all speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's got a question for the... Harvard Business Review says he's the number one CEO, whether he does or not. In fact. I'm gonna quit asking who's got a question. That lets some of you all off the hook. I'm gonna randomly pick people. All right, what's the question for this guy? 
what is the purpose of your company and how, you, how did you define it? How did you give well, the meaning to your people? The, the purpose of the company is to alleviate people with chronic conditions such as diabetes and other hemophilia and, and, and stuff like this. Uh, but it is also to create long-term value for the shareholders. Because if we don't, then we have no legitimacy. We are not a philanthropic organization. Very good. Thank you. So I, I have a question for both of you. Uh, as a woman, as a CEO, as a coach, do you have any advice on how to balance building a family as a woman or building a career? How to do that? This is an area where I would say even, well, not, well in Scandinavia, we are faring very poorly uh, because we have created a society where almost unilaterally we are depending families on two incomes. And, um, and this makes it difficult for a woman to, on the one hand, have a career and then take time out and, in the period of where it's very important to raise a family and then come back uh, again. The companies are moving along. We have, I, we've been struggling with this in my own company. We are doing equally, averagely poor uh, like any other European uh, companies. I think actually in the United States the situation is somewhat different. There's more of an acceptance of diversity, both racial, gender, and in the United States. And so it, it is something which is to some extent culturally, socially determined, uh, but it's also something that, that we as leaders have to work with because we are foregoing huge amounts of talent and, and we are not really reciprocating the composition of our customers either. It's a, but it's a, I've never been able to find the, the, right, the right tool for this. Malcolm, okay, um, Marshall may have. I certainly don't have an answer. I have an answer to a question, which is not exactly your question. Hopefully it will be helpful to you as a woman though. I am asked to speak in many women's leadership programs. I'm writing a book on women in leadership right now with Sally Helgeson. Uh, I'm typically the only man that shows up at these things. I think because I'm a Buddhist, they think he's a little weird anyway, what the hell, have him show up at the women's program, right? So I've talked to many women's leadership programs. The average woman, so for the women in the room, the average woman gets better 360 degree leadership feedback than the average man. Now this doesn't mean every woman gets better feedback than every man. Statistically, the average woman gets better scores than the average man. Uh, tons of research, that's not a theory by the way, that's a fact. For the women in the room, the average woman has one issue to deal with consistently and amazingly more than the average man and I may see it in your face. What is this disease? The desire to be the perfect everything to everyone. Women are statistically harder on themselves than men. One coaching I have with women far more than men is, please do not be so hard on yourself. Please don't be too hard on yourself. Women carry around a lot more guilt than men. Drop all of that guilt. Drop all of that guilt. <laughs> do your best, make peace. Does that make sense to you? Men, look <laughs> up here. <laughs> men, pay attention, men. Men, 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 look up here. Men, yes, men, there are learnings for us in this stupid and unfortunate Center for Creative Leadership Research. Yes, men, for us, we must admit there's some bad news. Yet, men, for us, there is good news. Men, the bad news is, according to this idiotic research done by the Center for Creative Leadership Studies and my friend Jim Kuzis and Barry Posner, the bad news is, as leaders, we must tell the truth. We're not as good. Yet, men, for us, there's good news. The good news is, we don't care. <laughs> By the way, the women in the room are going, oh my God, it's true, it's true. I have one question, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, for you. Thanks. Um, is there one partic particular approach or method that's most valuable, valuable for you? in your business life? I find it a very, very difficult question to answer uh, because I would, I would be giving you an answer which is relevant for the time that I was leader in a specific context 
of the development of my company in a specific business, I don't think it may necessarily be relevant for you. And it's also something to do with my personality. My predecessor is a Renaissance person, a extremely well-recognized leader in, in, in my country and abroad. Uh, I'm 100% the opposite, completely different from him. So I, I would not be able to give you a good answer, actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, who's got a good question for me? You look like you have a good question. How are you coaching leaders uh, facing disruption? You know, I'm an expert at the micro, not macro level. So I help people achieve positive long-term change in behavior. So I'm not an expert on the strategy at all. The only way I deal with this, I say, here's the changes you want to make in your company. How can you be a great role model in your own behavior? And I help them do that. I don't know enough to answer the bigger question about society. OK, who's got a good question for the number one leader? Yes. OK, quick. Okay. Uh, what is your most important gift or, or quality to help coaching leaders? The biggest, I'll start with the problem first, my biggest problem, and I have trained thousands of coaches. The biggest problem with every coach I have trained, including myself, is the ego of the coach. <laughs> including myself. Why? We want people to get better so we can look in the mirror and feel good about ourselves. And it's very hard to get over that. Very hard. My, the great coach, Alan, the great leader, Alan Mulally, what did he tell me? The secret of great coaching is clients. You pick the right client, you win. You pick the wrong client, you lose. <laughs> Most of us never understand this. He said, don't make it about yourself and your own ego and how smart you think you are. You, you were, hey, look, anybody could coach that guy and look like a hero, I can tell you. <laughs> I mean, I coach that guy, I'm God coach of eternity, right? <laughs> He's got people in Denmark who are idiots of eternity. I coach them, I'm a fool. I'm no different. I'm no different. It's not about me. Most of us never understand this point. Have any of you ever attempted to change the behavior? Look up here. How many of you have ever attempted to change the behavior of a wife, husband, or partner that had absolutely no interest in changing? Raise your hands. Come on, get these hands up. Yes. And ha ha how many years have you been engaged in this partner changing crusade? <laughs> uh, I would say 25 years. How's it working out for you? No, no. <laughs> I have another question. How many people in this very room are still stupidly attempting to change the behavior of mommy or daddy who has no interest in changing? Come on, come on. <laughs> yeah. uh, them too. Mo mommy, daddy, or both. Same thing. You're changing everybody. I was teaching my class at Dartmouth. A woman raised her hand. I said, are you trying to change mommy or daddy? She said, daddy. I said, what's his problem? She said, he doesn't have a healthy lifestyle. I said, how old is daddy? She said, 94 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the old boy alone. <laughs> yeah, for him. Oh, I already had two. It's his turn. Yes. I have a question regarding you being uh, the former CEO for a company of 40, 45,000 people. How are you the world's best CEO also for each of those 42,000 people? How do you... How are you visible for them? How are you in contact with them? Or how were you in contact with them? Yeah, I, I, can, I can just mention the, what I saw being the change over time, because we, we grew approximately staff-wise 10% per year. Uh, so when I started out, uh, I, mean, I remember the first summer party I went to. Uh, there was 900 people. We could, be, we could, uh, we could easily f fit into any any major mansion in, in Copenhagen. Uh, so um, there you could get a personal touch, you could interact with people, uh, but increasingly as the company became larger and larger, you had to institute some structures to how you communicated so, and use uh, internet, uh, you know, modern communication tools. Uh, so we spent a lot of time communicating with new employees, employees from different countries traveling and I spent actually I would say maybe a third of my time communicating either to employees or to shareholders. Okay, so one a, ver more a very very important question. Yeah. One more for Lars because I got two before that. Sir. We've been here for almost two days now and discussing quite serious business. So I have, I have a question for you Lars. Um, 
What was the most funny moment as uh, CEO of uh, Nova at the time you remember? When, had, when did you have the biggest laugh? <laughs> oh, that is difficult. That is, that's a really, really difficult, difficult uh, question to, to answer. I think winning is good. You tend to have more smiles when you win. And, and, and especially if you have faced adversity uh, let me give you an example. Uh, we had a pro product recently, uh, which is a new diabetes product that we sought uh, approval in the United States for. It was approved in Europe, but not in America. And uh, the FDA asked us to do some very, very significant studies, which took three years. And I was so, first, when we got the reply from the FDA, I was so mad. And then, I got over it and said, let's fix it. And then we, we undertook the studies. And when we got uh, the results of the study, I have to admit that we laughed uh, because it showed exactly, and it were actually better uh, than, than no difference. It was actually showing that our product had a beneficial effect on, on heart disease. So I would say those are some of the time. And, and there's, of course, other contexts which uh, are not professionally related, but I'll. I'll, I'll spare you that. <laughs> okay, who's got a good question for me? Let me look around. Let's see. Ah. Yes, sir. So what would you say would be the one or maybe two skills that are most important for leaders to develop? You know, I'm going to answer it slightly differently. Again, I have to answer with what I know. My area is helping successful leaders become more effective. Three variables that I found of all the people I coach that are most related to them increasing effectiveness. One, courage. You have to have the courage to look in the mirror, and that's hard. It is very hard to do that. Number two is humility. You see, it's hard to improve if you're already perfect. So you have to have the humility to say, I can get better. I'm not perfect. And then the third one is the discipline. You have to have the discipline to do the day to day to day hard work required to get better. When my book, What Got You Here, Won't Get You There, was the number one best-selling business book in America, the number one best-selling diet book in America sold 10 times as many copies. <laughs> Americans get fatter and fatter and fatter while purchasing more and more diet books. Well, you don't lose weight because you purchase a diet book. You gotta go on a diet. When I coach people, they don't get better because I'm a good coach. They get better because they're good customers. First thing I tell people when I coach them is, uh, by the way, in my coaching, I do not get paid if my clients don't get better. I don't get paid one cent during the entire engagement. They get better as judged by everyone around them. I get paid. They don't get better. I don't get paid. There's a way to test if someone believes what they're saying. You can ask a person one question and instantly determine their level of belief. I've never seen the question fail. What is the question? Want to bet on it? Do you want to bet on it? They say, I believe it, but I don't want to bet on it. They don't believe it. They say, here's the money. They believe it. When you get paid for results, you learn humility. You learn humility and you learn that nobody gets better because they have a coach. Nobody gets better because they read a book or they go to a class. You want to get better, you got to do the hard work required to get better day after day after day after day after day. It's not some kind of religious experience. It's that day-to-day -day hard work. Does that make sense to you? Okay, question for Lars. Yes. Um, I would like to tag on to the woman before me that asked the question about female leaders and female CEOs. We very often get the advice what women need to do to become female leaders or CEOs. We need to be more risk-taking, we need to not be too hard on ourselves. What do men need to do to make sure that we have more female leaders? I think, I think we men are, or at least I can speak for myself, <laughs> uh, at least. Uh, I think men are biased in the way uh, they assess performance and uh, the balance between performance and effort. Uh, and, and to some extent, we reward risk taking. Uh, and this may not necessarily be what you want in an accounting department or anything like that. So, so I think uh, when we, if we really want to change uh, the possibilities for women in corporations, we have to work on our own biases. 
because only through that will we be able to give a fair assessment of the potential. And, and I, don't, I don't want to favor any gender, but I think we should at least give a fair opportunity. And I don't think that's necessarily being given today because of our biases. Yeah, I have one other suggestion back to your question. I think it's really good for leaders who are men to mentor at least one woman, to mentor at least one, because you know that, that way, look, you're not always gonna win. You're trying though. You're giving it a try. Does that make sense to you? Okay, very good. Who's got a question for Lars? For Lars? Okay, Lars, I have a question for you. Now I'm taking risk, uh, I'm a woman, and I would like to interview you for a book I'm writing. Again, could you please? I would love to interview you for a book I'm writing. I'm taking risk, I'm a woman, so I'm inviting you for a one-to-one -one meeting. <laughs> How can I say no? Wow, thanks. <laughs> Very good. By the way, this is a good role model. Take a risk, she took a risk. Did it work? Yes, it worked. Right? It worked, it worked. Very good, all right. <laughs> Let's see, sir, do you have a good question for me? Yeah, what are the top three uh, things you don't do as leader? Okay, I, would, I, I have a book called, that's what my book is about, what not to do. I was interviewed <laughs> in the Harvard Business Review. I was asked a question, what is the number one problem of all the successful people you have worked with over the years? What is their number one problem? And yes, as I look around the room, I see it in your eyes. What was my answer? Winning too much. What does this mean? If it's important, we want to win. Meaningful, win. Critical, win. Trivial, win. Not worth it? Win anyway. Winners love winning. In the game of life, you're all winners. It's hard for winners not to constantly win. I'm now gonna give you a case study of winning too much that almost all of my clients fail. Almost all of you will fail this case study. When I say fail, you will fail yourself. You will say what I did do is the opposite of what I know I should have done. Here is the case study. You want to go to dinner at restaurant X. Your wife, husband, or partner wants to go to dinner at restaurant Y. You have a heated argument. You go to restaurant Y. It was not your choice. The food tastes awful and the service is terrible. Option A, critique the food. Point out our partner was wrong. This mistake could have been avoided had only you listened to me, me, me. Option B, shut up. Eat the stupid food. <laughs> Try to enjoy it and have a nice evening. What would I do? What should I do? Almost all of my clients, what would I do? Critique the food. What should I do? Shut up. How many people in the room, please raise your hands, have ever critiqued the food before? Hands in the air, including you. Hands in the air, hands in the air. Food critiquers. A room filled with food critiquers. Was that smart or stupid? Stupid. And as stupid as it was, I'm gonna give you an example now that is so hideously stupid, it'll make that one pale by comparison. And I will predict half of you have done this. You have a hard day at work, a hard day. You go home, your husband, wife, friend, or partner's there, and the other person says, I had such a hard day today, I had such a tough day. And we reply, you had a hard day. You had a hard day. Do you have any idea what I had to put up with today? Do you think you had a hard day? We are so competitive, we have to prove we are more miserable than the people we live with. <laughs> I, I, gave the, I gave this example to my class at the Dartmouth Tuck School. A young man in the back raised his hand. He said, I did that last week. I asked him what happened. He said, my wife looked at me. She said, honey, you just think you've had a hard day. It is not over. <laughs> Now, one final example from my book, Triggers. A young man sent me an email to send my book, Triggers. If any of you would send me such an email, I'd be very proud of today. <laughs> he sent me an email, he said, I want to send you an email today and just say thank you. He said, yesterday, I was having a terrible day. And my wife called. And she was having an awful day, and she was talking about what an awful day she was having, and I was under a lot of pressure, and. I was just getting ready to point out how her problems paled in significance to my own. He said, for some reason, I remembered your little class. I stopped, I started breathing, and I thought, this is my wife, somebody I love. This is not the enemy. He said, I just listened, and I said, thank you for everything you've done for the family, I love you. 
Then he said, I went home, spent $25. I bought her some flowers. I gave her the flowers. I said, I love you. He said, that was the best $25 I've ever spent. Thank you. <laughs> well, next time you have to win and prove you're right, point out what a bunch of idiots everyone else is, take a deep breath and ask a question. <laughs> what am I winning here? What am I winning? What am I winning? Okay, that's about it. I think we're about it. Marshall, I have one question. Since I was invited here, it's being together with the, the greatest coach on earth. One thing, have you reflected on the difference between self-worth and self-confidence? Uh, I, I definitely. That's uh, because I, I think, I mean, I, you cannot change your childhood and how you were brought up, and your personal character is formed by that. Um, but I think we are dealing, I mean, CEOs typically are people that have a lot of self-confidence. Right. Uh, back to this win, 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 to be recognized and to be reconfirmed. Uh, but in reality, it may, it may hide some lack of self-worth. Have you come across this in your research? You know, what, what I feel like is, and I think you said it very well in your own life, when you're young, that win, 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 win thing is not that bad. You need to win. You need to prove how smart you are. You need to achieve things. Certainly nothing wrong with that. As you pointed out to me, though, when we were talking, every time you get promoted, it becomes less and less about you and more and more mm. about them. And by the way, as you said in your own life, to me, he's a case study. You got better. You changed. You changed. You're not the same person you were when you were young. No. You got some humility in there somewhere. Well, again, I think it's very healthy to start with that win, 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 I'm going to be right, win and prove yourself attitude when you're young. A great leader told me, for the great individual achiever, it's all about me. And for the great leader, it's all about them. It's very hard to make this transition from a great achiever to a great leader. Now, we've got a lot of people here from Denmark, is that correct? At least quite a few. This guy did your country proud. Was ranked number one CEO in the world. How about a standing ovation for this guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Give a great round of applause. Thanks. Thank you to Marshall Goldsmith and Lars Rabian Sorensen. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Be careful. Okay, you have 25 minutes and then you're back here for the European Business Lecture 2017.